Hello and welcome back. We're so glad you're here. Oh, yes, we are. This is my good friend, Bookwormy. I am Valerie Monroe, and we are here reading some more tonight of Journey to Naguanis. Tell them about what was going on. I certainly will, Bookwormy. Now, if you remember, Brogdon had fallen from the branches into an eagle's nest. And once he was in the eagle's nest, he was kind of unconscious. And when he woke up, he found that he wasn't in the nest by himself. He was there with a gnome woman and her baby. And as they got talking, he realized that the gnome woman's husband was none other than the gnome he had met way back at the beginning of Down the Swale, the gnome he was trying to rescue, the gnome who was delivering treasure. And we found out from the gnome woman that Finley, that's her husband, was delivering something called the Amber Rose when he went missing. And she's asked Brogdon to please go and look for her husband. She says, because she can't go look for him, she has a baby to take care of. She says, you must find the Amber Rose and bring Finley home. And he said, I will try. And just in case you're wondering, you may I showed you what a little gnome has looked like before, but... Here's a little woman gnome. So maybe that's what she looked like. And this little woman gnome actually sits on a little swing in my gnome village. But I brought her over here to show you today. Let's go on with chapter three of Journey to Naguanis, Trouble in the Swale. Brogdon returned. Oh, if you remember, remember why he was out there in the first place? He was supposed to be finding Willow Bark. He didn't even do that. All got knocked out of his hands when he fell. Brogdon returned home empty-handed. No basket, no willow bark, no anything. Worst of all, he was hours late. By the time he reached the hut, it was pitch black. He looked through the window and saw Aunt Hazel and Aunt Gladys seated at the table waiting for him and worry lines crossed their faces. A wave of gratitude and love washed over him. He was really lucky to have them. They had raised him since he was a baby, and he wanted nothing more than to rush inside, fall into their arms, and reassure them that he was safe. He would even welcome the lecture on the importance of being home before dark. The weariness in his body from his adventurous day also made him want to crawl into his own bed and fall asleep, which is why it was so hard to do what he knew he must do. He had a handmade raft stashed near the swale in a thick, thick line of bushes. Lightning had felled a large branch from a tree by the brown house at the end of the summer. Such windfalls were rare occurrences, and before the house dwellers carved it up with a power saw, he took the opportunity and snagged enough small twigs and branches to build a vessel. It was not the first time he had constructed one, he had made and used his first raft when he and his aunts had gone to rescue Maggie, the lock baby, during his last adventure. The raft was somewhere in or most likely under the waters of Lake Oaxaca. This new raft, he was proud to say, was much better than the first. Definitely stronger. Brogdon considered it a capital idea to keep a raft on hand at all times because you just never knew when you would need one. The current was very different from the one that had been traveling through the swale on the day he had encountered Finley. This time the water was slow and lazy, and that was good. Brogdon eased the raft into the water and climbed aboard. His mind was as sluggish as the water itself. He had absolutely no idea where to begin searching for Finley. For a fleeting moment, he wondered if he should have waited until morning so that he could have so that he could think more decisively. He decided to drift leisurely while he gathered his thoughts and formulated a plan. Night sounds accompanied him on his journey. So I guess he didn't tell his aunts that he was going. Owl hoots and a few cricket calls. From up ahead came a humming sound that grew increasingly louder as the raft fro floated along. The sound broke apart into high and low pitches. Then Brogdon heard individual voices. He rounded a bend and almost smacked into a jumble of canoes, kayaks, and dinghies. 
as well as creatures freely swimming. And there in front of him was a spectacular traffic jam causing a complete halt in the swale. What's the trouble, he asked a goose who happened to be paddling by. Blockage, the goose clipped, a large branch down, I believe. How long do you think it'll take to clear it? Hard to say, the goose replied. I heard they're trying to get a crew of beavers in to help with the removal. Oh, this is most annoying as I am set to leave tomorrow. Sorry, Brogdon inquired. He had no idea what the goose was talking about. My flight is departing from Lake Wahakmo at 1700 hours. I'm flying south, of course, he replied, rolling his eyes as if Brogdon was completely lacking in intelligence. Now, you know why a goose might be leaving in the fall. They're getting ready to migrate to somewhere warmer. Well, seeing as you have wings, why don't you just fly down to Lake Wahakmo, asked Brogdon. Because I am conserving my energy, obviously. The goose turned away and then muttered something under his breath about ignorance concerning migration. Brogdon craned his neck and peered around the large bird, trying to figure out what was happening up ahead. Suddenly, an important-looking groundhog appeared on top of a large rock on the swale's bank. He held a hollowed-out gourd filled with hundreds of fireflies. The yellow light cast a warm glow over the confused shadowy forms in the water. Ahem! The groundhog cleared his throat loudly. That's right, everyone, over here, I've got news. Getting no response from the crowd, he yelled even louder, I say, do kindly give me your attention. It is with great disappointment that I must be the bearer of some bad news indeed. As you may or may not know, a thick branch is currently blocking the swale. We have sent for some beavers to re begin the removal process. However, it may be several days before they arrive as they are currently in the middle of a dam renovation at the north end of the lake. This is pretty bad. I guess nobody's going to get through in the swale. A general grumble arose from the throng of parties and Brogdon heard snippets of their frustrated conversation. Oh, late already. How are we supposed to? What will we do? Huge inconvenience. This is sort of like being in a traffic jam when you're late to work. The groundhog held up his furry paw. Silence, he commanded. I understand that many of you are traveling, be it pleasure or business. We will do the best we can to accommodate your needs so that you can continue on to your destination. He paused briefly to catch his breath. And thanks to the generosity of our burrowing friends, we are pleased to report that there are several underground tunnel options. The groundhog then referred to a piece of paper, which he held up to the lighted gorge. Ant tunnels rabbit burrows and chipmunk pathways will remain open free of charge for a period of one week or until the branch is removed. He looked down at the crowd in the swale. Now, if you will all line up in an organized fashion, we will measure you and direct you to the appropriate tunnel. Oh, it took the better part of an hour for the creatures to exit the swale and abandon their slew of boats and canoes along the bank. Then each traveler stood next to a notched twig so his or her height could be measured. Sort of like a yardstick if you want to try measuring yourself. Brogdon waited in line while the groundhog directed a field mouse into a chipmunk path and a pair of honeymooning worms to ant tunnels. Can you imagine worms that got married? They're going on a honeymoon. Who? And I was so enjoying the romantical boat cruise. The new worm bride sighed as she and her worm groom inched away through the grass. As long as we're together, it's romantic enough for me, her spouse consoled. The groundhog insisted upon measuring Brogdon, even though it was obvious that he would only fit in the rabbit burrows. After all, he was a foot, 12 inches tall. Rabbit burrows, the groundhog stated, and then added, you might find the ceilings low, so try to hunker down a bit. Save yourself a headache later. 
And that's where we'll stop today. When we come back, Brogdon is going to go into a rabbit tunnel. And we'll see what that next part of his adventure is like. I'm looking for bookworm. Oh, here he is. You want to say goodbye to everybody? Goodbye, everybody. Hope you have a great evening. Join us next time for more of Journey to Naguanis. See you later. Thanks for being here with us today.